everyone welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with molly if you are new around here if you've never seen my face before then hi my name is molly if you hadn't just guessed and i post true crime videos like this every single week so if you think that's something that you might want to stick around for then definitely subscribe before i say anything else i do apologize if you can hear a lot of birds in the background of this video i'm currently filming quite early in the morning so you may be able to hear birds. Today we are going to be talking about the unsolved case of Angela Hammond and this case was suggested to me by someone on Twitter a couple of weeks ago and I had never come across it before so I decided to google it and read about it and oh my god it sent shivers down my spine. I just knew as soon as I started reading into it that I had to cover this case and share this story with you guys. So as usual I would love to hear your thoughts and opinions on it in the comments of this video and having said all that let's just get into today's case. So this case took place in April of 1991 in the city of Clinton in Missouri which is in the US and this is Angela Marie Hammond. Now she was a 20 year old woman and she was born on the 9th of February 1971. Her parents were called Marsha and Chris Hammond and from what I could gather online they were really good loving parents and for the first four years or so of Angela's life the family lived in Kansas City but they decided to relocate to Clinton in Missouri where Angela's grandparents lived. And not long after the family moved to Clinton Marsha and Chris became pregnant with their second child and they gave birth to a baby boy whose name was Lauren. So this baby boy was Angela's little brother. And Angela and Lauren had great childhoods. Like I said, their parents were very loving and caring. However, eventually Marsha and Chris Hammond decided to separate and they moved away from each other. But despite them splitting up and separating from each other, they were both still actively involved in their children's lives. Anyway, as the years went on, the city of Clinton remained Angela's home and she loved living there. It was a small town with nice people, just a really friendly community. It was just a really nice place to live. As Angela grew up, she was described as being a very intelligent young girl. Um, her friends said that she was so much fun. She knew how to have fun wherever she went. There was never a dull moment when Angela was around. Her friends also described her as being very energetic and bubbly and positive. She was just a very positive person in general. And when Angela was 19 years old in November of 1990, she met an 18 year old boy named Rob Schaefer. Now Rob was a high school star athlete. He was very sporty, very energetic, and he had dreams of joining the military. And soon after they met, Angela and Rob actually began dating. They began seeing each other and they fell in love with each other really quickly. They were really sweet and well-matched couple. And the following year, in January of 1991, Angela told Rob the news that she was pregnant with their first child and Rob was absolutely over the moon about this. He was so excited and he actually decided to proposed to Angela after this. He asked her to marry him, to which she said yes. Once they were engaged, Rob and Angela moved in together in a rented trailer home. Um, Rob was still making plans to join the military later that year, and Angela was working as a bank clerk whilst also taking college classes at the Central Missouri State University. And everything just seemed to be going perfectly for the couple. They they were engaged, they had just moved in together, they were expecting their first baby, they were both accepted into each other's families, they were just happy. But that would all suddenly change in April of 1991 when Angela Hammond was abducted. It was the evening of April the 4th 1991 when Angela and her fiance Rob Schaefer were attending a barbecue at Angela's mother's home. And it was a really nice night, they were talking with friends, it was just a really 
relaxing normal evening. A little after 9pm, Angela and Rob left the barbecue and they decided to head back to Clinton because Rob had agreed to babysit his younger brother Justin that night and he told his mother that he would be there to look after him by 9pm. So the couple left the barbecue and Rob went to go and babysit his younger brother Justin but Angela didn't actually go with him because she had plans to meet one of her friends named Kyla just to catch up for a couple of hours. And then Angela and Rob agreed that they would meet up later that night in town once Rob's mother had returned home. So Angela met up with her friend Kyla and they were catching up for a couple of hours and then at around 11.15pm the friends said goodbye to each other and they parted ways. So once Angela had said goodbye to her friend Kyla she made her way to the nearest payphone phone booth and this was on the corner of 210 South 2nd Street right by what used to be a parking lot but I believe today it's a car um, dealership place but I believe in 1991 when this case took place this phone booth was right next to a um, like supermarket parking lot. Anyway Angela went to this payphone and she rang her fiance Rob and she told him on the phone that she was just exhausted and that she just wanted to go home and relax in the bath basically. If you remember they did have plans to meet up in town but she basically just said to Rob on the phone I'm just gonna go straight home and get in the bath. Angela and Rob spoke on the phone for about 30 minutes and when it got to around 11.45 p.m. Angela began telling Rob on the phone that there was a quote conspicuous man in an older modelled green Ford F-150 pickup truck circling the block several times around Angela in the phone booth. And Angela understandably was feeling pretty nervous because it was the middle of the night she was on her own and this driver of this pickup truck was acting really strange. After a few moments the driver of this truck pulled over near Angela, he got out of his vehicle and he walked towards the unoccupied phone booth next to Angela. So there were two phone booths and Angela was in one and this strange man walked towards the other one. A little later the man walked back to his truck and he grabbed a flashlight and he began like waving this flashlight around. He looked like he was looking for something. I am Imagine at this point that Angela must have been feeling very uneasy and so to break the tension between her and this man she asked him if he wanted to use the phone that she was using and remember she at the time she was on the phone to her fiance Rob so he could hear all of this on the other end of the line. So she asked this man if he wanted to use the phone and he just said no and then all of a sudden Rob heard a horrifying scream come from the other end of the line it was his fiance Angela. Now Rob and Angela's home was only about seven blocks away from where Angela was in the phone booth and so as soon as he heard Angela scream he tossed his phone to one side and he immediately jumped in his car to go and save her. Whilst Rob was driving to save Angela he noticed that a pickup truck matching the description of the one Angela described on the phone darted past him, was driving really fast past him and there was a woman inside this truck screaming Robbie it was Angela. So Rob immediately put his car into reverse and he made a U-turn in the road and he literally began chasing this pickup truck. And he was doing this for about two miles but unfortunately his car transmission failed when he attempted to turn right which made his car stall in the middle of the road and so the truck with Angela inside actually got away. So Rob had no choice but to get out of his car and begin walking back towards town and luckily a motorist that was passing him stopped and offered him a lift and Rob accepted and he asked this motorist to drive him straight to the police station so that he could report that his fiance Angela had just been abducted. So Rob told the police everything he knew about this man that was hanging around Angela while she was in the phone booth. Um, everything that she told him on the phone including what Angela described this man as looking like. Angela told Rob on the phone that this man was quote filthy and bearded. 
He was apparently wearing coveralls. He had a dark coloured baseball hat on and he also had glasses and a full beard with a moustache. Like I mentioned earlier, Angela said that the truck he was driving was a green Ford F-150 with a white top and it was quite an old model like late 60s to early 70s. There was also some damage to the left side front fenders part of the vehicle and on the rear window there was a mural of a fish jumping out of water. So an investigation into the abduction of Angela Hammond began and the police came up with a composite sketch of the person of interest, the man that Rob had described to them. However, when the composite sketch of this man was released, I'll put a picture of it on the screen now, when it was released, Rob was really confused because it doesn't really look anything like the man that Rob described. Rob said that this man was bearded, he had a moustache, he had glasses, but if you look at the sketch, he doesn't really have any of these features that Angela described to Rob while she was on the phone. And I believe that Rob did raise these concerns with the police. He said, this sketch doesn't look anything like the man I described to you, but nevertheless, this was the sketch that was released to the public. And I cannot understand why. I don't understand why the police would release a sketch of a person of interest that doesn't look anything like the actual person of interest. But perhaps it was because initially in the investigation, the police were very suspicious of Angela's fiance, Rob Schaefer. They believed that this story of a man in a pickup truck abducting his wife seemed a bit planned and convenient. And so for about a week, the first week in the investigation, Rob was actually the main suspect in the case. But shortly into the investigation, he was ruled out because the police discovered his car undrivable in the middle of the road where he said he had broken down that night. They also discovered Angela's car in the middle of the parking lot where she was abducted from and her purse was inside of her car. Rob also took a polygraph test about Angela's abduction, which he passed, indicating that he was telling the truth truth and two witnesses came forward to say that they saw the truck that Rob described at around 11.30 to 11.45 p.m that night just hanging around the phone booth that Angela was in. So the Clinton Police Department notified Angela's mother Marsha who as you can imagine was absolutely frantic and she let Angela's father Chris know who rushed straight to Clinton in Missouri to help in the search for his daughter. And it was at this point that the police began speaking to Angela's friends and family and just finding out more information about her and her life. Did she have any enemies, anyone that would want to do this to her, would want to abduct her? And after speaking to them, the police started looking into an ex-boyfriend of Angela's, 17-year-old Bill Barker. I'm not entirely sure why Bill was even a suspect in the first place, but I read on a couple of sources that it was rumoured that Bill Barker may have actually been the father of Angela's unborn baby. Um, but Bill denied these allegations, and after the police looked into him, he was ruled out as a suspect. They didn't find any evidence whatsoever linking him to Angela's abduction, so he was ruled out, like I said. The community in Clinton really came together during the search for Angela. They wanted to help find this young woman as much as they could. They put up missing persons posters literally everywhere, in every shop window, in diners, on lampposts. More than 250 volunteers, including Angela's friends and family, conducted an air and ground search in Clinton for Angela. They also searched rivers and wooded areas and fields and old isolated barns, abandoned buildings, but sadly there was no luck. There was no trace of Angela Hammond. 11 days after Angela disappeared, the Clinton police realised that they needed more help with this case and so they contacted the Missouri Rural Crime Scene Squad. And from this, 25 more police officers were added to the team to aid the investigation. In an attempt to find that 
pickup truck that Angela was abducted in, the Missouri Highway Patrol looked through their database of all registered vehicles and they compiled a list of around 1,600 pickup trucks that somewhat matched a similar description to the truck that Angela's abductor was driving. And from this, the police were able to identify potential suspects, but ultimately, all of them were ruled out and resulted in dead ends. And the police at this point didn't really know what to do. They were stuck because they didn't have anything to go on in this case. They didn't have any leads. And so they started looking into other disappearance cases within an 80 mile radius just to see if any of them could have been possibly linked to Angela's case. Maybe the person or people responsible for these other disappearances were also responsible for Angela's abduction. So the first disappearance case that they looked into happened in Max Creek in Missouri on January the 19th, 1991. So about three months before Angela was abducted. That day, 42-year-old Trudy Darby was working the night shift at a local K&D convenience store and at around 10pm that evening, she was getting ready to close the shop when she saw that there were three men outside of the store just kind of lingering. Now understandably Trudy was feeling very nervous and unsettled about these men outside the store and so she rang her son and she asked him to come and help her close up the store because she just felt really uncomfortable being there on her own. So her son agreed to come and help her close up the store and he arrived literally within 10 minutes of their phone call but when he got there his mother, Trudy Darby, was gone. She had just vanished. And then just two days after this, on January the 21st, 1991, Trudy's dead, naked body was found about 15 miles away in a river and she had been shot dead. She had been shot twice in the head with a gun. And then just one month later, on February the 27th, 1991, a similar thing happened in Nevada in Missouri to a 30 year old woman named Cheryl Ann Kenny. Cheryl was a wife and a mother to two children and she, just like Trudy, also worked at a convenience store located on Business 71 Highway. At around 10pm on the evening of February the 27th 1991, Cheryl was working at the convenience store and she was accompanied by the janitor of the shop and a male customer. Now the convenience store that Cheryl worked in would usually close at around midnight however Cheryl actually decided to close up a little early that night because it was a relatively slow day and so she let the janitor go home early. Once the janitor had left Cheryl counted the money in the till and she put the money in the back room of the store where it was usually kept. And at around 10.17pm that night, she set the store's alarm system and she made her way to her car in the parking lot, presumably to go home. However, she was never seen again. She never returned home and she's never been seen since. And her body has never been found, so we don't know if she is still alive today or if something more sinister happened to Cheryl and her body just hasn't been discovered yet. And then obviously just under two months after Cheryl disappeared, Angela Hammond was abducted. Now going back to the murder of Trudy Darby, three years after she was killed, her killers were actually caught. They were two men named Jesse Rush and his older half-brother, Marvin Cheney. And the reason they were caught was because, basically, after the murder, Jesse Rush could not keep his mouth shut and he would brag to his friends about the fact that he had murdered a woman and gotten away with it. However, his friends decided to turn him into the police and when he was questioned, he... I think he denied it at first, but ultimately he admitted to the crime. So Jesse and Marvin were arrested and charged with Trudy's murder. And whilst they were awaiting their trials, they were obviously in jail. And Jesse Rush became 
friendly with one particular inmate named Edward Thomas. Now, for some reason, Jesse Rush was under the impression that Edward Thomas was a lawyer, which I don't actually think that he was, but for some reason, Jesse thought that he was. And Jesse had an idea, and he thought that if he befriended Edward Thomas, the lawyer, he could help him get a lesser sentence for the charges of abduction and murder that he was going to trial for. And so whilst Jesse Rush was awaiting his trial, he began writing loads of letters to Edward. I think he wrote a total of 13 letters to Edward in which he incriminates himself further in Trudy's murder. And he also, in these letters, hints at the idea that he and his older half-brother Marvin Cheney may have also been responsible for other unsolved disappearances and unsolved murders. In a couple of the letters he talks about the details of Trudy's murder which I'm not going to read now because it's really horrible but I am going to read part of one of the letters where he implies that he committed other murders. So in one of these letters Jesse wrote, I never told you about them other bitches because if it gets found by accident it can get us involved in killing them other fucking bitches. The Cops don't even know about my brother and me killing any other bitches except Max Creek. Them other bitches in my last letter to you were both like that bitch in Max Creek. We all tortured the bitches, then fucked the dog shit out of them. In another letter, he wrote, I'm glad they, as in the police, don't know everything else we did or I'd be on death row. So he's basically hinting at the idea that he and Marvin may have been involved in other disappearances and murders. And so after this letter was discovered, people wondered whether Marvin Cheney and Jesse Rush may have been responsible for the abduction of Angela Hammond and the disappearance of that other woman, Cheryl Ann Kenny. In April of 1997, both Marvin Cheney and Jesse Rush were sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for the murder of Trudy Garby. And I believe that they were both looked into as suspects in Angela's case and in Cheryl's case. However, the police couldn't find any evidence linking either of them to those disappearances and so they were ruled out. But I'd be interested to know whether the police did look into the possibility that they were involved in other murder cases like Jesse alluded to in his letters. But like I said, they couldn't find any evidence linking either of them to the abduction of Angela Hammond. And as I mentioned earlier, the police investigating Angela's case didn't really know what to do. They didn't have anything to go on. Every single lead that they had, they had looked into and they just resulted in dead ends. That was until October of 1991, so about six months after Angela was abducted, when a man named Russell Smith came forward to the police. Now, Russell actually lived in Canada. However, in October of 1991, he was in Ulrich in Missouri because he was visiting family. Family that lived there. And obviously at the time in Missouri, this was only six months after Angela disappeared, so her face was everywhere. Her missing posters were everywhere. And when Russell came to Missouri and he saw Angela's face on this poster, he had a sudden realisation that he had seen this woman before. Russell was sure that he had seen Angela Hammond in Canada just a month prior in September of 1991. Obviously, when he saw her in Canada, he didn't realise that she was a missing person. And so when he saw her poster in Clinton, he realised that people were looking for her. And so he went straight to the Clinton police. Russell told the Clinton police that in September of 1991, he saw a woman that looked exactly like Angela get inside a green pickup truck that had a white top and a mural on the rear window, just like the truck that Rob described on the night of Angela's abduction. And Russell said that he saw this woman get into this truck outside a drugstore in Selkirk in Canada and then the truck drove away. And obviously at the time, he didn't think anything of it because he didn't know that this woman was 
possibly the missing woman but then when he came to Clinton he saw Angela's face and he realized oh wait I think I've seen this woman before and the Clinton police really thought that this was a strong lead they thought that maybe Angela was alive somewhere and so they contacted the Canadian police about this possible new development in the case and the Canadian police decided to follow up on this sighting and find out if this woman was really Angela Hammond now if you remember at the time that Angela disappeared she was actually about four months pregnant and so by this time in October of 1991 she may have had her baby if she was still alive and so the Canadian police visited all of the hospitals and baby stores in the area and they showed the staff Angela's picture in the hopes that maybe someone would recognize her because if she was alive and she did give birth to her baby chances are that she visited one of the hospitals or she went into one of the baby stores however when the police showed all of the staff members her picture none of them seemed to recognize her and so once again, this possible lead seemed like a dead end. But please let me know in the comments what you think about this possible sighting of Angela in Canada because I'm not sure if I believe that it was actually Angela. I'm not saying that I think Russell was lying by any means, but I just feel like he saw this woman outside this drugstore in Canada and he didn't know her. But then how a month later could he be like, oh yeah, I'm sure it was that woman that I saw outside the drugstore. Like how much do you really remember someone's face? I don't think I explained that very well at all, but I just feel like if I saw someone on the street that I didn't know, and then a month l later I saw them again, I don't think that I would recognise that that was the person I saw a month prior if I didn't know them. Does that make sense? I don't know, let me know what you guys think about that possible sighting of Angela in the comments. Personally, I'm not convinced that it was Angela. Anyway, about a month after this, in November of 1991, the crew for a television show called Unsolved Mysteries filmed a reenactment of the night that Angela disappeared in the hopes that this might jog some people's memories and bring forward some new witnesses. The episode aired about a month later however there were still no new leads by the end of 1991. And then in the summer of 1992, so just over a year after Angela vanished, another baffling mystery occurred in Springfield in Missouri in which three women, Cheryl Levitt, Susie Streeter and Stacey McCall, all disappeared on the same night. This case is known as the Springfield Free. Um, it's a very well-known case so you may have heard of it. I've never done a video on it myself but if you want me to cover it just let me know in the comments and I will add it to my list. But anyway this case remains unsolved to this day and shortly after her daughter Stacy disappeared Janice McCall actually became really good friends with Angela Hammond's mother Marsha. They formed a really good friendship because as you can imagine they understood each other more than anyone. Both of their daughters had just vanished without a trace and so they were there for one another and they supported each other in the nightmare that they were both facing of not knowing where their daughters were. They were even invited to go on Oprah Winfrey together to discuss their daughter's disappearances and that part isn't too related to the case but I just thought it was nice that these two mothers at least had each other as a shoulder to lean on and had someone else who really understood what the other was going through. Now I also read on a couple of sources that there was a rumour that serial killer Kenneth McDuff may have been responsible for Angela's disappearance. Kenneth was an American serial killer from Texas suspected of killing up to 14 people between 1966 and 1992. So he was caught the year after Angela was taken. And to be honest, I don't really know any more information about him. Like, I don't know if the police investigating Angela's disappearance ever looked into him as a possible suspect or if his involvement in the case was literally just a rumour. Because I only read that on one source, so I don't know if he was ever 
um, a person of interest to the police. I hope that they did look into him though because I definitely think that it is a possibility that he could have been involved. But I'm guessing that they probably did look into him and he was just ruled out. And sadly, Angela Hammond's case just went completely cold for years. Like I've said throughout this video, the police didn't have any trace of her. They didn't have any leads really. They had no idea if she was even still alive. I did read on a few sources online that in the year 2009, so 18 years after Angela disappeared, the Clinton police announced to the media that they had new evidence in the case of quote DNA nature due to the advancements in DNA technology. However, that's all they have said about this evidence that I could find. They never elaborated fully on what this new DNA evidence was. I'm thinking that maybe this new evidence was eventually like dropped or just didn't bring forward any new information in the case because I couldn't find any more information about that online. I don't know if the police are still following this up today if they're still looking into this new or what was new evidence in 2009 but this part confuses me though because they announced to the media that they had new evidence of quote DNA nature but like how because in 2009 it was 18 years after Angela disappeared obviously she's never been found her body's never been found the place that she was abducted from was a public place so how would they have gathered any sort of DNA evidence 18 years after um, Angela's abduction? That part really confuses me. But like I said, I couldn't find any more information on that. Um, there seems to be a lot of unanswered questions in this case. Around 20 years after Angela's disappearance, an age progression photo was released of what she may have looked like at age 43. So I'll put that on the screen now. But today it is almost 30 years since Angela Hammond was abducted and she has still never been found. Her body's never been found. For all we know, she could still be alive out there somewhere. Her family are still actively looking for answers about what happened to Angela all those years ago, and they still often speak to um, Rob Schaefer, Angela's fiance, who I believe eventually moved 60 miles away from Clinton in Missouri, and he actually has a family of his own now. But I can't even imagine how painful it must have been for Rob when Angela was abducted in 1991 because not only did he lose his fiance that day he also lost his unborn baby obviously Angela was pregnant. I believe there is still a reward on offer for anyone with information regarding Angela's disappearance and I don't actually know if police are still looking into this case today. I hope that they are. But yeah, that is it for this case. A really heartbreaking story. Angela was literally 20 years old and she had her whole life in front of her. She was so excited about the arrival of her baby. It's just so sad and so scary. These are the kind of cases that scare me the most because Angela was literally just at a phone booth and she was abducted and she has never been seen since and that is absolutely terrifying. But what do you guys think happened? Do you think that Angela could still be alive or do you think that she was abducted and murdered and her remains have just never been found? As usual, I really want to hear your thoughts and opinions on this case in the comments. Also leave me suggestions for other cases that you want to see me cover on this channel. Also make sure you are following my Twitter and my Instagram if you want to keep up with me day to day. I don't know where I was going with that. But yeah, if you want to keep up to date with my video schedule, then definitely follow those. I mainly update my Instagram, so probably better to follow that one. Quickly before I go, I just want to give a special shout out to the members of my Patreon page. Thank you so, 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 so much for your support, guys. Um, if anyone else wants to become a member of our little Patreon family, the link is always in the description of my videos. Please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you again next week for another mystery with Molly. Bye guys.